church today. So great to uh, gather together on a beautiful Sunday morning, have fellowship together. You know, we want to exalt the Lord and honor him. And when we think about Christmas, uh, we're really thinking about uh, God's plan of salvation and how he has fulfilled that. And I'm going to read for us out of uh, Psalm 116. It says, I love the Lord because he has heard my appeal for mercy. Because he has turned his ear to me, I will call out to him as long as I live. The ropes of death were wrapped around me, and the torrents of Sheol overcame me. I encountered trouble and sorrow, and then I called on the name of Yahweh. Yahweh, save me. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is compassionate. The Lord guards the inexperienced, and I was helped, and he saved me. Return to your rest, O soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, Lord, rescued me from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. And that's what we remember at Christmas, that God is a Savior, that he left heaven and he came into this world to save sinners from their sins, to save us. And so let's lift up our voices. Let's stand together as we worship the Lord. If you need the lyrics for the songs, just raise your hand. The ushers will come by and make sure that you get one of those lyrics. So let's worship the Lord. Amen. Joyful and triumphant.
Lord, we greet thee. have a screen to show you any pictures from this week, but uh, this week was kind of a, a family week, and so we hope that you had a, a, just a wonderful time with your family and friends there uh, at your homes, and uh, we want to welcome those that are with us on the live stream and those of you that are with us in the cars. If you're here in your car listening on the FM, just give us a honk. There we go. We got a, we got a few. Got a few out there. So, uh, Pastor Caleb is going to be sharing with you about uh, our Christmas Advent reading uh, plan that we have, and uh, that's in your bulletins. You could take it out and take a look at that. He's going to be explaining how this is going to work, but I'm just going to ask you to turn to one another, greet one another, try to see if you could find someone who's ever gone through an Advent reading plan. So go ahead and greet one another. Hopefully you were able to greet one another. We do want to give you a reminder that the children are meeting on the grass for Sunday school. And so uh, Sunday school is for the three and four-year-olds all the way up to sixth grade. So if you have children that you would like to have in Sunday school, they're just on the grass area just to the west of us. So let's go ahead and continue to worship the Lord. Come to Bethlehem and see in whose 
Thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your kindness, for the love that you have poured out to us. Father, thank you for this, this change of, of season as we look forward to Christmas. And Father, the hope that uh, it instills in us, uh, not just for your first coming, but ultimately for uh, your second coming. And Father, we pray that as we uh, have this break in our calendar, that we would focus on you, uh, that we would acknowledge everything that you've done for us, that we would uh, just draw uh, closer to you in, in worship and adoration. And Father, I pray for uh, those, those families in our church that are, are going to have a, a difficult season. Uh, Father, those that are uh, maybe going through the first Christmas without a loved one. Uh, Father, we think of all of the, the tragedy that, is, that has hit us this past year. And uh, Father, we, we want to be a church that, that comforts one another that reminds one another of of your goodness and your grace even in the midst of difficulty and so father we pray that you would you would be with them father that you would uh, through your spirit through your word and through your church be comforting them be reminding them of of your truths be reminding them of the the greater picture and father we pray uh, for those in the the congregation that are hurting now that are that are suffering uh, through uh, illness that have physical needs, those that are, are struggling um, financially, those that are going through mentally just a tough time. And Father, that you would uh, be comforting them and reminding them of who you are. Father, we pray that, that as we, we turn our attention to your word, God, that we would do so with a tremendous amount of care, that we would do so uh, with a reverence, understanding that this is, this is your very word for us. Father, I pray that you'd be with Pastor Caleb as he unpacks it for us. God, that we thank you for, for him and his study, for the dedication that he has put into to leading us as a flock. And God, we pray that you would give him a wisdom and insight and that we would have ears that, that don't just want to listen, but we would also have a desire to, to live out the things that you've called us to. Father, may we be, as a church, a, a light to the community. May we be represent a, a safe place where they know they can come uh, with any with any need uh, father that uh, that the community would see this church and the other churches uh, in the antelope valley as places they can go to for answers and for hope father we we love you we are we are so thankful to be here this morning uh, to worship you i pray that our worship would be pure and sweet coming from hearts that uh, desperately long to be with you in your sons let me pray Amen. For by him, Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything.
came humbly. For God's glory. We come and we worship. For there's nothing too difficult for the Lord. praises would ring throughout throughout the world even today that people would honor you Lord that they would bow, that they would adore you they would recognize that you can handle anything in this life and anything in this world, the discouragement, the disillusionment the poverty, the injustice Lord, you are able and we love you God and we, um, we give you our worship today Lord Jesus, come again, be in our hearts, be in our lives. Help us, Lord, to
depend on your strength in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. It's a lot warmer this service than it was last service. You guys are smart. I want to start out by asking you a question. I was um, sitting down with my, my dad on Thanksgiving and two of my uncles, and my dad asked this question. He said, what's one thing good that we have on earth that we won't have in heaven? What's one thing good that we have on earth that we won't have in heaven. And, and as we, we talked about it, we came up with, with several different things. We're not going to have marriage in heaven. Jesus says there's no longer any giving or taking in, in marriage. But we're not going to have evangelism in heaven. We, we won't need to evangelize the lost. There will be no loss. Everyone will know the Lord. But as we talked, my dad said, no, that's not what I was thinking. That's not what I was thinking. And then finally he said this. He said, no. One thing that we have on earth that's good that we won't have in heaven is hope. Hope. Think about that for a moment, if you will. Hope ends when heaven comes. You see, everything that we, we hope in, everything that we look forward to and we eagerly anticipate will be experienced in its fullness in heaven. There is no longer any forward longing. There's no longer any anticipating something more. There's, there's nothing more to look forward to. Because everything you've been looking forward to is now fully realized in heaven. Heaven is the end of hope, but that's a good thing. One of the things that I love about the Christmas season is the Christmas season teaches us to hope. It teaches us to hope appropriately. It teaches us to hope eagerly. I don't know if you have ever thought about what it means to hope, but if you've listened to me teach for any amount of time, then you have a working biblical definition of hope. And one of the things that we have to guard our hearts against is when we talk about hope, the world means something completely different than Scripture when it uses the word hope. In the world, the word hope means a wish. Something that maybe, probably, might happen. My students would say, gee, I hope I do really good on my SATs even though I didn't study. For them, hope is a dream your heart makes. Right? It's when you wish upon a star. It's some Disney fantasy where you do really well on the test even though you didn't study for it at all. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about hope in God's word. You see, in God's word, hope is an eager anticipation of a certain future. An eager anticipation of a certain future. Think back to when you were a child, or some of you are children, and some of you are children at heart. And I want you to remember what it was like to go through the Advent season. Can, can you remember the eagerness that you experienced as Christmas drew near? I, I don't know about you, but I can remember every single December. As soon as Thanksgiving was over in November, I started getting excited about Christmas. I looked forward to the traditions. I looked forward to my aunts and my uncles and my grandparents and everybody all being together. I looked forward to the celebration that we have. I looked forward to the gifts that would be exchanged, the food that would be eaten, the songs that would be sung. I looked forward to that day every single year. And something that we learn through the anticipation of a child's heart for Christmas is what hope really is. You see, for you and for me as children, when you're looking forward to an event, there was not a shadow of a doubt in our mind that it would come. We weren't, we weren't hoping, I sure hope Christmas comes this year. Maybe it'll happen. I don't know. Maybe the governor will outlaw it. I don't know if it's going to happen. I have news for you. There's no white witch. Nobody can cancel Christmas. Christmas is coming. It is inevitable. The Grinch can't steal it. It's going to happen. And you as a child, you knew that. 
There is no doubt in your mind. This event that's in the future is going to go down and it's going to be amazing. That's hope. That's what we're talking about in Scripture when we talk about hope. Have you ever thought about the fact that not only in heaven we will no longer need to hope about what's in the future, but in the garden before the fall, there was no hope. Now we say that, we say that phrase, no hope, that sounds terrible, right? But that was good because everything was good. Think back to Genesis 1. If you're going to go through our church's Bible reading plan, then what you're going to read today as a family in your homes is Genesis chapter 1. And in Genesis 1, we have God's commentary on his own creation. And what does he say after he makes everything? Every single day, he has the same comment, it was good. It was good. It was good. Over and over and over again, this is the commentary of God on his creation. It was good good. Everything was good. And then he made man. And it wasn't good that he was alone, so he made woman. And it was good. And he placed them in the garden together. And he gave them one rule. He told them there's one tree that you can't eat of, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Eve was tempted by Satan in the form of a serpent. And she ate and she shared with her husband who was with her. And he also ate. And then God came and he walked in the garden and they hid from him. He asked why they hid. They said we were naked and so we were ashamed. And God asked them if they had sinned. If they had eaten from the tree that he commanded them not to. And what happened? The blame game. Adam turns to his wife, throws her under the bus. It's a woman you put with me. And what does Eve do? She points her finger at the serpent. And so God turns to the serpent and he speaks a curse to the serpent. In Genesis 3, verse 14, it says this. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than any livestock and more than any wild animal. You will move on your belly and eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. And he said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. In your bulletins, you'll see it. It says Romans 8. I'm going to jump into Romans 8, but I'm actually going to focus primarily on Genesis chapter 3 today. So if you have your Bibles or you have Scripture, open that up and look at Genesis 3. And here's what I want you to notice. I want you to notice that in Genesis 3, we have the first pr promise of Advent. Advent. Today marks the beginning of Advent. And for hundreds of years, the church has set aside this season to remember the approach of the birth of Christ. So the word Advent, it comes from the Latin Adventus, which means approaching. And as the, the church would gather in the Christmas season, they would remember the approaching of the Messiah's birth. Well, the first promise of that coming Messiah, we find right here in the passage I just now read to you. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. You want to remember that reference. That's where that, that crimson line that we can trace throughout all of the Old Testament, that's where it begins, right there in Genesis three fifteen. It's called the, the Proto-Evangelium. It's the first promise that we have in Scripture of the Gospel, of the good news that sin. And it's power over us that Satan wields will be one day broken. But here's the amazing thing. The first 
announcement of the gospel. The first moment that hope began, it entered into the world in the middle of a curse. I want you to think about that for a second. Genesis 3.15 is the first pronouncement of the gospel to the world, and God is speaking to Satan. Sort of amazing if you think about it. Now, I have a question for you. I want you to look at the passage. Keep your eyes on the passage. I want you to find the two things in Genesis 3, 14 through 19, that God curses. Find the two things in that passage that God curses. And, and here's what happens. Here's what a lot of people do. When somebody asks you to find something in Scripture, you try to find it in your head. Don't do that. Actually, look at the passage because it's a little bit surprising. The two things in the passage that God curses. The first one you see in verse 14. The second one you see in verse 17. We're going to focus on these two curses today. And we're going to talk about how they proclaim the advent of the Messiah. Do you see the first one in verse 14? What does God curse? He curses the serpent. And then in verse 17, what does God curse? He curses the ground. You know, this passage, if you, most of you look at your, your Bible, the title of it is going to be The Curse. And a lot of people think that the curse is on Adam and Eve. The curse is on the serpent. The curse is on the ground. Now, the ground is cursed because of Adam. Do you see that? The ground is cursed because of you. And you're going to eat your food by the sweat of your brow. There's going to be painful labor. And you're going to return to dust. And so death comes into the world in this moment. But what's cursed right here is the serpent and the ground. So what I want to do is I want to look at these two curses. So the first one we're going to look at is the curse on the serpent. And what's the curse on the serpent? He's condemned to stay on his belly, to lick the dust. And then God says this, I'm going to put hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. You will strike his heel and he will crush your head. Look at Genesis 3.15. We see in that this, this curse that's going to result in hostility between Satan and Eve. But because of that hostility, there's going to be this promised moment where Satan will strike the heel of the promised seed of the Messiah. And the Messiah will in turn crush the head of Satan. That's our salvation. That's that moment where our salvation is made possible because the head of Satan is crushed. I think the easy way to remember it is this way. That hostility, the purpose of that hostility is salvation. The purpose of hostility is salvation. Salvation. Genesis 3.15, there's going to be hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. The purpose of that hostility is salvation. Well, how does that work? The first question we need to answer is what does it mean that Jesus is going to crush the serpent's head? I don't know about you, but I have a, uh, I have a son who loves dangerous animals. And he loves to, to watch these shows where they talk about all of these characteristics and traits of dangerous animals. And they spend a lot of time talking about poisonous snakes and the different things that they'll do with those poisonous snakes. It's amazing to me, actually, all of the medicinal uses of rattlesnake venom. But, but in some of these shows where they've talked about rattlesnake venom and different uses, they've also shown that they have this ability to actually extract the glands from the rattlesnake that secretes its venom. Now, when they extract those glands from that rattlesnake that secrete its venom, if they then took that rattlesnake and they let it go out in the wild, do you know what happened to that rattlesnake? It would die. 
it would not be able to make it in the world without its venom. Now, you might think, well, it still has fangs. Yeah. All it can do is bite you. All it can do is pierce your skin. It's been disarmed because its venom has been removed. What it means in Genesis 3.15 is that God is ultimately going to destroy Satan. But in the advent of our Messiah, in the birth of Jesus, in his life and then his death, he disarmed Satan. And I get that from Hebrews chapter 2. So I can't put it on the screen in front of you, which means you're going to have to turn in your Bible to the page. So turn to Hebrews chapter 2. And we see in Hebrews 2 what it means that, Satan crush, that Satan's head was crushed when Jesus died on the cross. So look at Hebrews chapter 2. It says this. Verse 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. Now what I want you to do is I want you to think back, if you have, if you have a physical Bible, you can actually flip back and forth between Genesis 3.15 and Hebrews 2.14, but what I want you to see is all the elements of Genesis 3.15 that are pronounced in Hebrews 2.14. So, so first of all, it talks about that inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. What is it saying? It's saying just like the descendants of Eve were made of flesh and blood, Jesus was also flesh and blood. What is this telling us? It's saying that he is the promised offspring of Eve. He is the promised offspring. So that's the first thing that we see right here. But then what does it say next? That through death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. What is this saying? It's saying through Jesus' death on the cross, he destroyed the one who had the power of death. See, Jesus' death on the cro cross, cross was the crushing of Satan's head. In that moment when he said, it is finished, he was talking about Satan. He was disarming Satan. How is it that, say, that Jesus' death disarmed Satan? It says it right here in the passage. It says, who through the power, he destroyed him who had the power of death. And look at the next verse. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You see, we were in bondage, and the power of our bondage was in the power of death that Satan used in every generation after Adam and Eve fell. He used the power of death to enslave humanity to himself. And Jesus took away that power. He took away that penalty by fulfilling it in himself. And in doing that, he drained the poison from Satan's bite. He took away the sting of death. Satan can still bite, but there's no venom there. Because Jesus destroyed the one who wielded the power of death. And then look at verse 16. Because in verse 16, we have one of the same words that we have in Genesis 3.15. Look at verse 16. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Do you see that word seed right there? What happens in Genesis 3.15? It's the beginning of the seed promise. Now in the Christian Standard Bible, it uses the word offspring. You're going to have enmity between your offspring and the serpent's offspring. That offspring, that seed, is then traced throughout Genesis. As, as each generation is born, we can trace the seed promises. God says, this is the blessed line. This is the blessed line. 
And so there's a blessing that comes down on, on Seth, the son of Adam and Eve. And we can trace that blessing to Noah. And we can trace that blessing through Shem to Abraham. And from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Judah to David. This seed promise continues throughout the story of the Old Testament where the long-awaited Messiah is promised and his line is kept alive. Jesus is the promised offspring, the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. Now, now I've been focusing on, on that crushing of the serpent's head, but you remember in Genesis 3.15, it's a two-part promise. Not only is Satan's head going to be crushed, but it says Satan is going to strike the heel of her offspring, of the promised seed. So, so my question then is why is that necessary? Why is that part of this pronouncement of the gospel? Why is it that Jesus needs to have his heel struck? Well, the passage goes on in Hebrews 2. It says this in verse 17. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Do you hear that? Why did Jesus need to have his heel struck by Satan? So that he could help us who suffer. So that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest who knows what it is to go through the pain of the human experience. That's our Lord. He understands what it is to endure tragedy, to experience your friend's betrayal. He knows what it is to experience heartache and pain. He knows what it is to experience the futility of life. Everything that we suffer through, Jesus has experienced. His heel was struck. And what does it say? He was suffered being tempted. Do you hear that? When was Jesus tempted? Well, Hebrews tells us he was tempted in every single point, just like we are, yet without sin. But in the gospel narrative, we see that Jesus is tempted when he goes out into the wilderness. And you remember how Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness? It says that he was tempted by who? By the serpent himself. You see, that tempting in the wilderness is Satan trying to strike at the heel of the promised seed. And what, what's interesting, if you look at it, Satan actually uses all the same ploys in tempting Jesus as he does in tempting Eve. There's three temptations. There's three things that Eve is tempted with. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's all Satan has up his sleeve. He uses it the same way every single time. And what happens with Jesus is he wins the victory. And because of that, he's able to aid those who are being tempted in the same way. And so we see this promise in the middle of a curse that hostility is going to result in salvation for the people of God. And I pointed out to you that the offspring, the promised seed is Jesus Christ. But what's interesting is in Genesis 3.15, it doesn't just say the seed of the woman. You notice that? Look at the passage. Look back at Genesis 3.15. It doesn't just talk about the seed of the woman. It also talks about the seed of the serpent. Now that's not saying that we're going to be scared of snakes our whole life. You know that this passage here is pronouncing the future gospel. So what does it mean when it says the seed of the serpent? There's going to be hostility between your seed and his seed. What is that talking about? Well, it's talking about the children of Satan. And you might think, well, how can Satan have children. He doesn't have children like Eve had children. But we see throughout scripture that there are children of the devil. I think that one of the books that makes that most clear is 1 John. I want to read to you from 1 John chapter 3 verse 8. In 1 John 3 8 it says this, the one who commits sin 
is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose to destroy the devil's works. Okay, whenever John is writing and he says, from the beginning, he's talking about Genesis. So you want to understand John, when you read his writing, he wants you to think Genesis when he says, from the beginning. So when he says, the devil has been sinning from the beginning, he wants our brains going back to Genesis 3. He wants us thinking about those passages, about those moments. And your brain should go to Genesis 3.15, which says, the Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. Verse 9 says, everyone who has been born of God does not sin because his seed remains in him. He is not able to sin because he has been born of God. Do you hear more words from Genesis 3.15 right here? It's now talking about the seed, but it's talking about the seed of the woman. Look at the passage. He does not sin. Those who have been born of God do not sin. Why? Because his seed remains in him. Who's the promised seed? Jesus is the promised seed. Now this is not talking about sinless perfection. This is not saying you're not a believer if you sin. That's not what it's saying. It's saying that believers can't sin. And you might think, well, I sin every day. You sin every day, I sin every day. That's true, but I can't. What do I mean? I mean, when I do that, I can't stand it. I can't dwell in it. I can't continue in it. I am miserable while I am living there. I am miserable while I am abiding in that. I was not recreated for that. My appetites have changed. My longings have changed. And the pleasure that I once got from sin, I can realize no longer. It's not saying that we will never fail. It's saying that when we do, we're miserable because that's not the food that our stomach enjoys any longer. Why? Because his seed remains in me. And because Jesus is dwelling within me, there's something foreign to my experience of sin that cries out and says, no, this is not who you are. This is not what you're made for. This is not enjoyable to you anymore. Repent, return, run away. That's who we are in Christ. The passage goes on and he says this. This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. Do you hear this? John is saying it's obvious when you look at the world around you who the children of the devil are. And who the children of God are. And one of the things I love about John, everything for him is in binary. It's either one thing or the other. There is no in between. There is no gray area in John's writings. That's how he writes. You need to understand that to read him correctly. And so what he's saying right here is there's only two lines in all of humanity. There's only two lineages. You're either a child of God or you're a child of Satan. And how you can tell the difference is whoever does not do what is right is not of God. That's how you can tell who the children of the devil and the children of God are. You can tell by the way that they live and specifically by the way that they love. And then he takes us back to Genesis again. And he says this. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. There it is. There's that word again. He wants us thinking about Genesis. We should love one another. Now what's interesting is we actually don't see that command to love one another in Genesis. But he says you've seen it from the beginning. Don't worry. He explains himself. Verse 12 he says this. Unlike Cain who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brother's were righteous. Do you hear that? Where does he go? He goes to Genesis chapter 4. We just now have been camping out in Genesis 3, and now John is talking about Genesis 4. And what happens in Genesis 4? You know the story. Cain and Abel. And what he's showing is that Cain was a child of the devil. Do you see that? Look at the passage. Right there, verse 12. Unlike Cain, who was of the evil one. Do you see what he's saying? 
He's saying Genesis 3.15, it promised seeds of the woman and the devil. And there would be hostility between them. And then Adam and Eve have two sons. And what happens? There's hostility between them. You see, in Genesis 3.15, what happened as part of that curse, there's this hostility. Not just between Satan and Eve, but between their offspring. And it's immediately realized for Eve and her sons, where one murders the other one. But that hostility has a point. That hostility has a purpose. The point of hostility is salvation. It was going to result in salvation for all of humanity. All of humanity could be saved because of what would ultimately happen. As a result of that hostility, Jesus would come and the Pharisees would be jealous like Cain and they would murder him. But in that death, God had a perfect plan for the salvation of all of humanity. You see, from Genesis 3, all of humanity has been divided into two families. You're either of the devil or you are of God. You're either a child of the devil or you're a child of God. But God's plan was to rescue those, everyone who was enslaved to the devil with the sacrifice of his son. And so he paid the price of redemption to redeem you from his enemy who for all of time use the power of death to enslave sinful humanity. But Jesus took away that power. Now I told you there's two curses. There's a curse upon Satan. And the point of that hostility is salvation. But there was also a curse in verse 17. And what was it in verse 17 that was cursed? It was the ground. It was the earth. Let me read it to you. Verse 17, And he said to the man, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. The ground is cursed. The result of the ground being cursed is that there is this futility that enters into life. There's this entropy that is introduced into creation in Genesis 3, verse 17, when God curses the ground. You know, the wisest man after Jesus Christ who ever lived was Solomon. And he spent much of his life trying to figure out the ultimate question. What is the meaning of life? The question that every human has to grapple with. And his conclusion he expressed in Ecclesiastes. And right from the beginning of the book he says this in Ecclesiastes 1-2. He says absolute futility. Says the teacher. Absolute futility. Everything is futile. What does a person gain for all his efforts that he labors at under the sun? You see, in cursing the ground, God wove futility into the fabric of creation. But futility has a point. Now that statement can sound ridiculous to anybody who understands the definition of the word futility. The word futility by its very definition means to not have a point, to be pointless, to not have any purpose. But Romans 8 tells us That there's a point to futility. Let me read it to you. Romans 8 verse 20 says this. For the creation was subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay and to the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together with labor pains until now. Do you hear that? He says creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but in hope. The point of futility is hope. 
You see, we were never meant to find our satisfaction in fallen creation. We are not meant to find our fulfillment here on earth. And if life was not futile, then we could find something to hope in here. But the reason that life is futile, the reason that all of life is grasping at the wind, is so that we will not seek below what is only meant for heaven above. You see, God knew that we would get distracted with the things of earth if we could be satisfied with the things of earth. But he didn't design us to be satisfied with the things of earth. He designed us for eternity with him. He designed us for fellowship with him. And so all of creation was subjected to futility so that our hope would be fixed on the one thing that doesn't change. And that is Jesus Christ himself. You see, everything in this life, it fades away, it tarnishes, it corrupts, it perishes with the using. Because I'm not meant to fix my hope on things that change. My hope is meant to be fixed on what is unchanging. And so God wove into the fabric of creation this futility so it would be constantly reminded, no, look forward, no, look ahead, no, anticipate what is yet to come. Because this life is not it. There is something more. Now, the way in which we as fallen humanity experience that futility that points us forward to hope is both universal and unique based on our gender. And what we see in Genesis 3 is that God uniquely allows futility to enter into the life of women and he uniquely allows futility to enter into the life of men. But that futility has a purpose. Its purpose is hope. And so that pain in creation that reminds us not to fix our hope on earth is experienced by women in labor pains. Listen to what he says in Genesis 3 verse 16. He says this. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. God says childbirth is going to be painful. But there's a purpose to that pain. And the purpose is to look forward to what lies ahead. You might have noticed in Romans 8, it says the same thing about all of creation. It says all of creation groans with birth pains. See, when a woman experiences labor, she is groaning with creation for something more, for something beyond. The eager expectation of the birth of that child is meant to be this reminder that something greater is yet to come. And the pain of this life is meant to point us forward to the joy of what is set in front of us. And so God builds that into creation. Labor pains are meant to be an earthly example of looking forward to hope while suffering pain. Generally, I think all of us experience pain, and I would say this to you, that pain is your tutor in hope. Last week, I told you you had a tutor. Remember that? I said, pleasures are your tutors in thanksgiving. Well, pain is your tutor in hope. Pain teaches you to hope in eternity, not in the things that can be taken away, not in the things that can change. Don't shift your hope from the things of heaven to the things of earth to a career or a relationship or health or whatever it is that you begin to hope in. Because when it's taken away and you remember it's all futile, you'll only have one thing left. And that's a promise of an eternity with your Lord and Savior forever. And that's what you hope in. That is the anchor for your soul in the stormy seeds of life. God curses the ground. He allows futility to enter into creation. And he reminds women of that futility and the labor that they experience. But this is what he says to man. 
In verse 17, and he said to man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. You will eat bread by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground, since you were taken from it. For you are dust, and you will return to dust. What is, what is God telling man here? He's saying all of your labor now is going to be painful. All of your labor is going to be painful. I think that, that every person can say they've experienced the futility of labor. Think about it. Don't think about it too much because it's sort of depressing. Because you work really hard so you can get a paycheck, so you can buy some food, so you can have some energy, so you can work really hard, so you can get a paycheck, so you can buy some food, so you can have some energy, so you can work really hard, so you can... And when does it end? Never! Well, it does end. One day you die. And then everything you earned, who gets it? Who knows? It all fades away. It all perishes with the using. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. All is vanity. Absolute futility. But the point of futility is hope. And so as we go through that, that pain of labor, as we go through the pain of a career and work, and day after day after day after day, and it's not fulfilling and it's not satisfying, it's all meant to do one thing. It's meant to point me to the next. I was never supposed to be fulfilled by the work I have here. I was never meant to be satisfied by the food that I eat here. It's all meant to point to heaven. The point of futility is hope. One of my favorite philosophers is a guy named Pascal. I think the reason I like him is because he's a mathematician. But he spent a lot of his time thinking about the futility of life. And he wrote a whole book about it called his Pensies. He wrote it in 1670. And one of the things that he said about the, about the futility of life, he says this, It is good to be tired and wearied by the futile search after the true good. He says it's good to be tired and weary after the futile search of the true good that we may stretch out our arms to the Redeemer. You see, we would never pursue eternal hope if there was anything here on earth we could hope in. We would not think of the things of heaven if the things of earth could satisfy us. But the dissatisfaction of this life, the futility of the labors of this existence are all meant to point us forward to what does not disappoint, to a hope that does not disappoint. See, we weren't created to live this life. We were created for fellowship with God. We were created to witness his glory and to reflect it back to him. And so both the pain of childbirth and the futility of labor, they point us forward in this expectant hope of an eternity that is promised to us. And this Advent season is about remembering to eagerly anticipate because our forefathers, those who went before us, they eagerly anticipated the fulfillment of a promise and it was realized. And we have in ourselves today as believers in Jesus Christ, we have the down payment as a guarantee. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's placed his seed within us. It says this in Romans 8, 23, And not only that, but we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies. Now in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he sees? Now if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patience. We're not home yet. But we have this spirit and we've tasted the goodness of God in this life. And what it does for us, it causes us to long for more. To long for fellowship with God in its fullness. 
And so now because we are his own people, the pleasures of this life do point us forward to that ultimate day when we will experience them as they were meant to be at his right hand. And so don't attach your hope to the things of this life. Remember, in this Advent season, the hope of Christmas was the Messiah. And it is for us now today, that future marriage supper of the Lamb. You see, for thousands of years, the children of Israel looked forward to their Messiah's birth, for their rescuer, for this salvation. But now we, as his purchased people, as those who are indwelt by his Holy Spirit as the promise of a future forever with him. We long for that day when we as his betrothed will be united with him and we will celebrate together with that marriage supper of the Lamb. And I have news for you today. Jesus is eagerly anticipating it as well. I get that from his promise on the night that he instituted the new covenant. Do you remember what he said? When he drank from that cup, he said, this is the last time for me, guys. Until I drink this cup anew with you in my kingdom, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine. I'm going to keep this pleasure, this good thing that I've longed to share with you. I'm going to set it aside until we all together as one can enjoy it again. Jesus is eagerly anticipating our future union with him forever. That's the only thing that satisfies. That's what you were created for. And my challenge to you today is quite simply this. It's to spend this time, this Advent season, redeeming the time in his word as you learn more and more to eagerly anticipate our Messiah's return. Read the story. Read the promised story. Of the one who came and crushed the serpent's head. So that we could realize that futility has a purpose. That this life is not what we were created for. That we were redeemed. So we could live forever with our Savior. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. That you have rescued us. That you are the propitiation. That you are the payment in our place. We thank you, Lord, for taking the curse upon yourself. For taking upon your own head the punishment, Lord, that we deserved. That was rightly ours. You suffered in our place. You broke the power of death. Lord, you took away the venom from our enemy. So that now, Lord, we are no longer enslaved to the devil, to the power of sin. We are people for your possession, set apart to live lives that reflect you. Help us, Lord, to honor you with lives that point the world around us to a hope that does not disappoint. Help us, Lord, to have such an obvious hope in this Advent season that the world that looks at us would question the hope that we have. That they would wonder what it is that keeps us going, what it is that we're looking at, that we're looking forward to, Lord. And I pray that we would have an answer for those who ask. Help us, Lord, to be a people who hope so radically and so obviously that the waiting world would see that we have what they long for, that all of this life is futile and satisfaction can only be found in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.